Hi, and welcome everybody to uh, Michael Chekhov, the NMCA way. I am Lisa Dalton, president of the National Michael Chekhov Association, and my colleague is... Hi there, I'm Will Kilroy, the vice president of the National Michael Chekhov Association. And we are bringing you today the third of a series of five episodes about uh, Michael Chekhov's five guiding principles. And our invited guests today are all National Michael Chekhov Association alumni with us today. And um, so if you are watching, you may have a copy of the Michael Chekhov playbook. And if so, on page 79, you will find where the five guiding principles are. And we have done a guiding principle number one, which is the practice of psychophysical exercises to affect artistic states. And we did uh, number two, which is the use of intangible means of expression to produce tangible results. And today we are discussing employing the creative spirit and the higher intellect to unify various aspects of your performance. So our uh, perspective on working with these five guiding principles looks to uh, address how we use them personally as artists and also how we're using them in the classroom. Are we using them where, so, so when we open for questions and discussions, we want to hear from you all, um, are you using it? Are you, you know, how are you working with it and what questions do you have about it? So before I go any further, I just want to ask Will if you have any uh, leading thoughts, any be, because I will in a moment go further into more what Mr. Chekhov says about it, but anything you want to share? Sure. I think for me, this is where the spirit of Michael Chekhov comes in and maybe your own personal spirituality of thinking that we do have this higher power and you can think of that as only within yourself or you could think of that power to me as stretching further beyond just ourselves. And I think it takes a lot of faith because you have to realize that the choices you're making via the checkoff technique will all come together. They will all amalgamate. You do have that creative higher intellect within you that will naturally bring them together. And I think particularly as a director, sometimes I will get wacky ideas as I did in this last show that I just directed and think, I'm not sure how that's going to fit in with that or with that, but let's try this. And then finally, when I see it, uh, I know, I trust that somehow it's going to come all together or we'll adjust it so it will fit with this or that. So I think it's going with those creative ideas that come to you, really trusting that intellect, creative intellect, not the more left brain, but more the right brain, creative side, uh, and following your instinct and impulse and then trusting that it will all come together into the whole. Great, great. So um, as I go into a little more what Mr. Chekhov himself says about this guiding principle, we'll just review why we care about guiding principles and it's guiding us to what. And so a guiding principles intent or objective is to help us know what to focus on, to give us a framework, a set of bullet points in effect that we want to train ourselves in and that we want to train others in. They are key concepts that he felt were most central to his technique, to the practice of it and to the teaching of it and the employment of it or one might say to the synthesis of it into our world as a creative being. So his central point in this third guiding principle has to do with unity and the nature of the spirit and how it is through our spirit. And he really does introduce this by saying, we are talking about spirituality. And so I know in the, out in the world today, there's some controversy about whether it's appropriate to 
publicly uh, attach the concept of spirituality to Michael Chekhov. Uh, when you hear him, it's obvious that he's moving it forward himself quite boldly and quite publicly. Uh, although that was not always the standard in days past. And your particular environment and your particular belief system may not uh, suit uh, you in terms of A, embracing it fully and B, promoting it or utilizing it blatantly in your work. So it's important to understand that we have creative individuality and that's part of the nature of spirit, that there's no judgment if we're not able to bring it into our work in uh, as boldly as he does in these discussions. Uh, however, there are many good reasons to, and there are many ways to. And so later on, we'll talk about how uh, some of the practical ways that NMCA has woven it into the pedagogy that you might not be aware of um, is influenced by this guiding principle. So, he talks about several things that are absolutely essentially uh, doable. What is doable because we have the power of spirit within us. And the first is he discusses the attitude toward the character. He has in earlier sections of this audio series spoken about having an attitude toward the character that is free of judgment, that opens itself to compassion, and that through having this objective uh, approach to the character, we are able to fall in love with the character and render the character, no matter how evil it might appear uh, or simplistic or uninteresting or whatever, however the character might appear, that we through our creative spirit and through our higher ego, creative ego, we are able to behold that character free of judgment and therefore we can render the character with this love and compassion, which leads to the other uh, point that he makes that he spoke of earlier in these lectures, which is the nature of love. So we won't go fully into the love lecture. We'll make that another event. Uh, but the, the fact that we love our characters, the fact that we love our art, that we love our audiences, that we are able to unite with our audiences, that is a essential task that our spirit provides us. Without that spirit, we would not be able to unite with that same way. We would not be able to engage in what we know as the five communions. Without spirit, we would not be able to unite with the playwright who's connected with a field of images. We would not be able to unite with our director, with our colleagues, with our mise-en-scene, with the audience. We would, we need that sense of spirit. And so it's very practical in this way. Now, uh, he goes on to talk about the soul and he distinguishes the soul and spirit in, in that he talks about the soul. And if you want, you can do this with me. Just imagine when I, uh, what might the gesture, and you don't have to stand up, but you, if you want, you could. But, but he says this soul is tasked with um, accumulating experiences. That's it. So what, what is your gesture? I mean, can you feel the gesture of to accumulate experiences? It's like how, you know, where, where are these experiences? They are everywhere. And if you do this gesture of to accumulate, um, yeah. And somehow it, then, then the spirit is he says it's kind of like a subconscious laboratory and it unifies it amalgamates and it draws conclusions so if we take take this phrase draws conclusions which he includes um in uh, one of the chapters on 
psychological gesture. He talks about creating a gesture of drawing a conclusion. So do a gesture. What is your gesture for drawing a conclusion? Like, what is, what is that? How is that? Where does it live in your being? Uh, you know, how is it? Um, amalgamate. How is amalgamate uh, different than, than accumulate? All right. See, draw a conclusion, amalgamate, and he says, um, uh, summarize, also summarize. So jump back for a moment to accumulate, right? Gather, accumulate all these different experiences, and then what happens to it now draw conclusions from those experiences you, they unite they come together and from that we can sort of extract and draw out of this accumulation of experiences some information some uh, perception that is connected to the feeling of the whole and he indeed attributes the ability to have a feeling of the whole, to recognize a feeling of the whole to our creative spirit, that without that, we would not be able to understand a feeling of the whole. And without understanding the feeling of the whole, without the ability to unite, we could not ever have a feeling of ensemble. And you can start to see that, you know, elements of our chart would just start disappearing, wouldn't they? Uh, if, if we did not have this creative spirit to unite mm -hmm. the entire chart, uh, it would fall apart. It would simply just be an accumulation of experiences. And he says that um, the psychological gesture is the condensation of all the details of the uh, of our work on the character and again this sense of uniting condensing is a unifying process and without that spirit we could never find the higher ego and so it is the synthesizing power uh, a direct quote the synthesizing power is the power of our spirit. Mm. And that without our spirit, our art would be simply a bunch of disconnected details. And we speak about how uh, when we practice and are developing a character or even developing our skill sets, just our repertoire of skills, we work on one tool at a time. And we've all experienced, you've all experienced this process of working on a scene with one tool at a time, one tool at a time. And uh, you hear Will and I keep saying, don't worry about how it's going to come together. Don't worry about it. your talent will be like a magnet. It'll suck all the good parts to it and it will unite it. And that's, mm. that is what we're speaking of. We're talking about your talent uh, and and that is united with your spirit there. So the creative power within us is our spirit. That's one of his statements. And to create oneness out of the multitudes. And that is when we are creating a production, well, to create oneness out of the multitudes, that's the singular uh, in task that the director has, right? To find a sense of oneness out of the multitudes. And it is also the task of the teacher to, because the teacher is guiding a group and they can only be, when they're with the group, they can only be one person. And so they need to find a way to move the oneness of the group, move the group in a sense of oneness while holding this awareness of the unique creative individuality of the members of the group. 
the same task as the director, right? So it is your creative spirit that is able to take all the experiences that your soul is taking in and be able to find the way to guide yourself mm -hmm. through those processes. <clears throat> and let me just check. Um, Mr. Chekhov says that we would not actually be able to understand the concept of archetype without our spirit. And that is a very interesting uh, concept to, to think about how the nature of archetype and prototype is related because it goes into a realm where uh, an archetype is like the uh, extracting the common uh, threads of a whole group. So if you say the archetype of a parent, what, what is the archetype of a parent? You look at all parents and you see what do all parents have in common? It's a extracting and right, a condensing, a synthesizing process of bringing together all the common elements and finding the most um, pure ideal form of the type and this would require this higher ego this creative spirit this sense of the spirit now he does say that he, he goes on to talk about the enemy of spirit um, and our creative spirit the thing that kills murders our creativity is the lower intellect the critical it criticizes it's a critical mind that cuts and chops and digs into and tears away at our vulnerable creative self and so he the entire technique is designed to help us free ourselves from these, uh, the lower um, critical, uh, yeah, judgmental ego there, and which really is about dividing. So he posits that tendency of the intellect to cut, separate, and divide, as opposed to the spirit which unites mm -hmm. and brings together. And he says there is, however, a very important part um, that is what he calls the noble and lofty intellect. And he says, in this um, unconscious laboratory that we have, the scientist, the head spiritual scientist is that creative spirit, that spirit, and, uh, and that creative spirit has a, 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 an assistant, which is the noble and lofty intellect. And this intellect is important. It's significant that he's not asking us to act, you know, turn ourselves into uh, idiots by shutting our mind off. There is a higher part of the mind. He makes the distinction between what is the noble and lofty intellect versus what is the critical lower intellect by uh, offering us the image that the lofty intellect is something that is merged and permeated with the soul forces of the feeling forces of the heart. That it is in effect heart centered thinking. And that is what distinguishes the noble intellect from the lower ego critical intellect. It is an intellect, it is a, a thinking force which is permeated with the love, uh, the heart-centered process of love. And uh, I, I think most of you have probably heard me tell the story of how I was quite worried about whether or not I was unique enough. And when I was a, a young actress and I made a lot of really bad choices 
um, based on trying to be different, trying to prove that I was different and trying to make myself special. So my intelligence would be directed to looking at the script and deciding everyone's going to do it that way. So I'm going to do it this way. And it was very fear-based. And so when I would do it this way, it didn't always make sense with the larger whole. It didn't make sense necessarily with either the style or with the whole, whatever it was, it was desperate, fear-based, coming out of a, um, a the lower critical self. And it, and now, generally, <laughs> I'm able to make smarter decisions because I can engage the intellect with my emotional centered loving self and say, is this decision coming out of a creative impulse that is united with the feeling of the whole? Or is this coming because I'm afraid everyone else is going to do it that way and I don't want to do it that way? So we all know that actually if I did it exactly that way, it would be unlike anyone else because you are unique. So even if you do it exactly the same way, it will be unique. And that is because your creative spirit is always in you. So um, the final thing I want to talk about is that he speaks of enthusiasm as something that comes from this sense of the spirit. And this is this, um, <clears throat> when he talks about the, the, noble intellect and when it fuses with the love in your heart when they fuse they create this flame this burning they create burning ideas so that's when we get oh gosh i know what i want to do oh yeah let me go do that and with those burning ideas then the uh, the higher ego is able to work with those and help sort through and help select and inspire you with the perfect one in the perfect degree of expression. And uh, so that enthusiasm uh, is a, a, a central part of what comes when we merge the higher intellect with the, um, with the creative spirit and the uh, love, uh, the forces of love. And as a, um, and, and as a conclusion, he discusses the fact that all of our exercises are actually ones that unite us uh, and unite all the exercises build in us the skills to activate that uniting quality of the spirit. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Will to share any thoughts that stimulated, uh, that were stimulated by that. Well, one thought that I had is I also think it's that lower intellect that leads people to become very defensive mm -hmm. and almost to seem like they have an overinflated ego or narcissism where they're lashing out at other people with that lower self and how mm -hmm. dare you say this. They're not open to feedback. Some of us might run into that as teachers where people put up a wall because they're not accessing that higher self. They're staying in that lower ego, that lower intellect. So that's something that I have run into before, that it's uh, you're discounted with what feedback you give because they can't get out of their lower self. So I'd be curious to hear from some of you whether that uh, has been something you've experienced or witnessed. I will share. I mean, that was absolutely me. You know, when I think about my... My undergrad, especially, you know, those years, I started when I was 17, my undergrad, and I graduated when I was 20. And um, it was about being enough. It was about not feeling that I was enough. It was about, you know, what should I do here? And what, what should I not do here? And what are other people going to think about me? And am I doing this the right way? And uh, as a teacher, I... I actually feel very blessed that I experienced so much of this early on because I feel that I can, I can, I can notice it, that I can spot it, that I can, you know, sympathize, empathize with what's going on inside them. I, I recognize that, 
And um, I think in recognizing that um, I'm able to, to more easily move them into, you know, what is this, this whole um, higher ego influence, which I didn't really realize was coming from my higher ego, which is the care and the, and the heart and the understanding. Um, so yes, definitely. I think part of me as an artist has had to um, come to grips with and accept and, and love my younger self even love my younger self as the artist and give and forgive myself for for being that as well that's interesting one thing i'm thinking about is now that my classes have trans are now online i have some students in my acting class that i'm actually in all of my classes that are not engaged and they're not participating and i wonder how I feel like maybe that's their lower intellect that is making them feel like whatever video I post isn't going to be good enough or um, I, you know, I, I can hear their critical voices saying, well, I, I don't have the technology, you know, they have lots of excuses. They have lots of reasons why this is difficult. And um, so this makes me think about ways that I can help them um, engage that higher that higher intellect to say let me problem solve it's going to be okay whatever i do will be perfect that it will be um that 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 it'll be okay i also think that this whole uh covid 19 thing is a an actually a battle between our lower and higher uh, <laughs> egos or i don't know what because um there are people who, who really, a lot of people that I didn't even know had have them had them had it in them, uh, are actually becoming more um, more at one with the the universe. I don't know if if I am saying it correctly. It sounds big, but. People are uh, starting reflecting and uh, trying to do things, to do good things with the community. And they are really in their high place. And there are a lot of people that go down and um, a lot of conspiracies and staying at home and um, sleeping and waking up at uh, eight in the evening. I don't know. So it's a really a battle, um, I feel now. I think with uh, my students, like Janine, what you're talking about, and I have some students like that, is to really be encouraging to them at this point in time and to really be super flexible about what's acceptable at this point. I know even our administration is encouraging us to really not lower our standards per se, but just be more open to what is acceptable at this point. And as I was saying earlier, I have found kind of Ophir, what you're talking about is some of them have risen to this higher level than work they had done in class. And maybe it's because they are on their own and they are connecting to this higher creative self. And it's coming out because no one's watching them. They can videotape themselves. They can do it as many times as they need to. And it's their creative ideas. So like I say, I've been really impressed with some of the work I've seen. And there are those students that have kind of fallen by the wayside and I try to reach out and, hey, how can I support you? And I know you can do this and you can make it through. And that has sort of allowed them to step up slowly but surely. So we'll see how the end of the semester goes. But I like, Ophir, what you said. There's kind of that battle going on, higher, lower. So some people are letting themselves rise above with this challenge and some are letting themselves get beaten down a bit. The whole idea of crossing the threshold is one of the very important and perhaps most significant things that we can, can bring from this, this realm of, um, of spirit. Because what we're inviting when we invite ourselves to cross a threshold into the into the playing space, into the workspace, into the creative space, is actually, uh, it, it, that is one of the techniques that is activating us, uh, act, is activating in 
when we cross the threshold, it is an invitation for us to allow that higher spirit to be more active. And in this time of working out of our own private spaces, where these spaces that we're in serve other functions, they are where we're eating, they're where we're sleeping, they're where we're whatever, we're playing, whatever it is, we're hanging out. They are these spaces that are every day. They're very, very connected with our everyday lower ego. So especially when we're teaching, but also if we're working on our own, utilizing the, uh, the concept of crossing the threshold into the space, taking the class across the threshold, in whatever way you do it, whether you, you know, want to reverse the hoop and bring down a hoop and set it into, you know, this is your creative thing. If you don't want to use the term cross the threshold, take an exercise like making friends with. So before we begin, let's start by making friends with the space. So we cannot make friends with the space without that higher self because we're inviting ourselves to go into this world of fantasy and start communicating with the pen and the wall and the chair and, uh, and the rug that I keep tripping over and the you know, smallness of the space or the whatever it is that is in that space. When we make friends with it, we are crossing a threshold. We know this because we actually shift the atmosphere in the space. So in some way, finding a way to invite people to cross that threshold, even when they are um, at home doing their home play and creating a video, for example, for you that, you know, hey, baptize the space as special, you know, fill it with, you know, creative fairies, whatever superpower, you have the superpower to transform this space and uh, you're a magician. That's what we are as actors. We are magicians and we transport people into new worlds in, in new stories. And we magically transform ourselves and our spaces. We take black boxes and we create whole worlds. So we can do this um, if we actively think of crossing that threshold and, uh, and we can bring down you know, from our, our creative sphere, any kind of presence we want in that space. And we can also just because the, now is a great time to offer how checkoff tools can be used to help you in your everyday life to keep remembering that you have uh, your four brothers of art, which this the form of what is going on can be found to be beautiful, which is what you all have just been speaking about, how some people are really rising to the occasion. And, um, and we can feel the impulse to reach out to try to help those who are starting to, to sink from it. So all those impulses are coming out of that flaming heart, the ideas that you come uh, up with to reach out are uh, all part of that higher ego opportunity. Any, Jacqueline, did you want to share something? Um, I wasn't going to, but since you asked, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's funny because I uh, was actually talking to Scott Fielding today and he, he was encouraging me. Um, he actually mentioned, he was like, I know you studied with police, so you should go back through your old books, start from the beginning and create a home ritual for yourself. I know she has one, pull it out, do it. And um, cause I was just talking about how something I've been doing during this time is finding ways to maybe access people or things that have been really great for me that I can't access right now, but, or I haven't been able to, but now that I can, you know, like I moved from Boston to the Southeast and I love studying with Scott. And I haven't been able to because I don't live in Boston anymore, but now I've been able to get back into his classes. And I was just sort of talking about like, how can I get more? And um, he, something he said to me was, create your own ritual and start off of what you've gotten from Lisa and begin first with crossing the threshold. Create 
the creative space for you. And he really emphasized it. And I feel like I've been hearing that a lot lately. Um, and you know, it's like, oh yeah, sure. Okay. I'll do that. But I feel like I keep hearing it that now I'm going to make more of a conscious effort to really do that. And it also just made me feel sort of empowered that, uh, like it, it was just a fresh, a breath of fresh air a reminder that you have given us these tools yet, you know, mm -hmm. and we can use them and doing them for even just a little bit every day is enough and it will add up to something. And, um, it's funny talking to Scott today that I remember that you had this thing. I'm like, I want to sign on. And then you're talking about all this stuff and it's like, Oh my God, all the messages are coming. I'm just going to listen. <laughs> you know? So, um, thank you for that reminder again. That's great. Now, now's a great time to do that practice, observe, apply home play mm -hmm. process. And uh, it's a, you know, very easy. You can expand on it, but it's, you know, just pick one tool, play with it for five minutes, you know, fully unveiled and, and work with it. And then three times a day for one minute, do something using it, apply it, you know, contract with your little pen or whatever. And, uh, and, uh, you know, do some mundane activity, brushing your teeth, eating your breakfast, whatever, um, and, and observe it and, and look for it. And you can observe it through online memes, or there's a whole, uh, I don't know if you guys have heard, and this is, to me, this so comes from the spirit. There's, um, View, views from my window on Facebook, uh, people from all over the world are paste, posting photos that they're taking from their, from through their windows. And uh, it, it's amazing. You can just look at, you know, views from my window or whatever, and, and you can find and anything about the technique, you will be able to find examples of in those photos. So, uh, even if you feel you don't have something to observe the expression of the tool uh, in its natural uh, venue, you would be able to through the internet. And to that repetition of um, three times the law of triplicity, once in the morning, once midday, and once in the evening, uh, implants in you a sense of continuous acting so that you are always that artist and that at any given moment you can take a little give yourself a little artist break and in the evening or whenever you feel you can go back and summarize through your ideal uh, self your higher self you can summarize all these experiences so when we look at how we started today uh, talking about the soul, the soul is gathering these experiences, right? Um, the, it's gathering the experience of practicing the tool. It's gathering the experience of observing and applying it. And then that higher self is able to synthesize and draw conclusions, which then you can journal, uh, you know, in that, in that reflective process. So it's, a lovely series and uh, you know just a great opportunity to um, start playing with that uh, anyone have anything to say I have a question if not so my question Janine did you have something oh just a little wow. something you were just talking about how the spirit pulls all those things together I'm reminded of our students who are plodding along in rehearsal and then all of a sudden it all comes together for them that all of that plodding along all of that work and you worry that they're not going to get there they're not going to get there and then all of a sudden they blossom at the end and you're like where did that come from but that's the power of their creative spirit taking all of that rehearsal all of that mulling and then bringing it to fruition beautiful yeah. mariah did you have something you wanted to share yeah, I would love to share an, an experience. Um, I, uh, I'm a choreographer for my acapella group. And um, if you've never, if you, any of you have seen Pitch Perfect, we do that competition. It's an actual real competition. Um, it's like, the, it's international, it's beautiful. Um, 
and I choreographed uh, through Michael Chekhov, which was a really, really cool experience uh, for me. And so I, before I even started teaching the choreography, I taught them everything I knew <laughs> about Chekhov. And, um, and at first, of course, the, the, these are people that are not movers, they're just singers. A lot of them are like bio majors, so they don't understand creativity. <laughs> and um, it was really cool getting to see them open up and getting to see them be able to move and feel emotion in certain ways that they couldn't show before. And, you know, I, before we went to the competition, I, I took them through the angel walk, um, which was, gosh, just so beautiful. And um, it, they loved it. And when we entered the space of the stage, when we went to quarterfinals, um, we went through the threshold and, you know, before we did everything at the end of every rehearsal, we'd radiate to each other and, it was just so beautiful. And we, um, when we had finished, it was so great. And I actually got uh, best choreography. Um, I won the award for best choreography, which was awesome, but it wasn't me, it was Chekhov. <laughs> um, and now that we're separated, we're such a tight knit group. But now that we're separated, we are still virtually sending, there's a, the, the hand emoji. And we're still virtually radiating to each other and sending each other goodwill, which has just been so awesome. I just wanted to share that. Oh, that's so great. I love that. Woo. <laughs> that's really wonderful. Uh, so I wanted to just review um, in, and it's very specifically outlined in uh, point number three in the book on page 79, the, some of the, uh, elements of the NMCA pedagogy that are specifically uh, directly connected to this guiding principle number three, um, the sphere of images, the whole concept, uh, the whole idea that there is uh, this sphere is something that is really a pra one of the really truly practical ways of bringing in the concept of the higher ego, uh, the, of the spirit, our creative spirit. And it's one of the ways that you can reframe, uh, rephrase if uh, particularly, if you're not in an environment that's willing to work at this level, obviously, right? So um, Mario Rica Michaela is, has a, uh, it uses the planet imagination, right? Uh, perfect. It's perfect. Uh, the your your own little uh, iCloud of ideas. Um, the the um, you know the the bubble. There's lots of different ways that you can phrase this concept, but just the the languaging, like just pretend that or imagine if there were. Let's pretend, let's agree to pretend that there is this big bubble sphere around the earth that contains all the ideas, everything. It's all, all the characters living there, et cetera. That whole concept of the sphere of the imagination is, becomes extremely practical. And he, Mr. Chekhov was in fact speaking about that before he began to teach in English and he shifted calling, referring to that and explaining it with those kinds of images uh, when he started teaching in English and he started using more the term the higher ego and less the terms of spirituality. And, and that also leads to the goblet, which is again, another one of our um, uh, exercises that understanding the, the nature of the goblet, understanding ourselves as training ourselves to be receptacles for this inspiration that comes in. And so, uh, so again, feel free if you're in a situation where working with these ideas is too esoteric 
or too obscure to take those and find a way because they're very practical. And that's Mr. Chekhov's bottom line is and NMCA's bottom line is about practicality that you can take anyone and say, just imagine that you can inhale and be like this big, you know, goblet, like a champagne glass, just sort of drinking in the bubbly inspiration. You can make this into uh, many, many different kinds of images that your actors can uptake in a way that is digestible for them. And uh, the, the whole quantum peak, and I'm curious to know, uh, you know how many people are using that, that whole piece of the pie concept uh, that we all have our own little slice of the pie. We have one piece of the pie, and we, but we are this whole pie. We are this whole sort of that, that is, we are this spiritual being and we are still a spiritual being, but we express in everyday life only one small little slice of that whole spiritual being. And when we create the character, we are creating a whole other spiritual being that has its own little slice of the pie. And they uh, they are able to connect and relate to each other. Our pure, full, higher ego is streaming into that character. It's streaming into us. And we, when we explain this concept, if we explain this concept of the individual artist as in their everyday self, living in one small portion of their super potential, you can then use that. And when you recognize it for yourself, you can then use that for yourself and as a teacher to help troubleshoot when frustrations arise. I, I can't do this. I don't recognize it. I don't understand it. I'm not good at this. All these vulnerabilities that we find when we're seeking inspiration and seeking a training to help activate inspiration so when we know we're all working out of some limitations and our characters will have them and the work will help us overcome them, uh, all of that is directly uh, expressing and working with this guiding principle number three. It's looking to solve a problem that I found, especially as a teacher, where uh, actors were really frustrated when they couldn't get something. And when they, when I could simply say, not a problem, it's not in your pie. It's not in your slice of the pie. But if we do this exercise, you can, you know, expand the ingredients of your pie. So I, I want to ask, is anybody using that slice of the pie or some similar thing? Well, I certainly use it in all my classes. I think it's just a great uh, pictorial that you can draw on a board and show them that and show them how we're operating and how you came into the world and what your biological and environmental circumstances are and how that does dictate that. However, how as actors, they want to expand to be able to do more. And I always think about Mala Powers, one of our co-founders talking about this and saying how Michael Chekhov told her that she can access any character that ever was or ever will be, that she has full access, kind of what you're talking about in that sphere. And then it doesn't have to be as sometimes method actors do that they feel like they have to have experienced it, they have to really be it, so to speak. But instead, through that imagination, you can pull down, whether it's the prostitute or the rageful character or whatever it is, you have access to it. And I think if you can believe in that, knowing this is your piece of the pie that you operate in. However, you do have access to all the rest of it if you train yourself well and you're open to it. Uh, and that's kind of how I work with it. And I think it gets students really excited. And then when they're making comments, they now even comment and say, oh, that was really outside of your piece of the pie. I've never seen that before. So that ends up coming up in class. So I think it's just a fun uh, bit to use. I, I use it. Um, I. I had a few uh, reviews that it's 
not that anyone told me something, but I just saw faces. But after I did it a few times and with uh, professional actors and students, uh, people got it and they said it's a great thing that I taught them, that I showed them this, you know, uh, thing. Uh, I got, I got uh, a lot of good reviews with that. I mean, good, um, how do you say, responses. Anyone not using it because you don't understand how to offer it? I definitely use it. Um, I began in my, in my teaching as an acting teacher using that idea in terms of tactics. What tactics are easy for me and what tactics are difficult? Well, the, the tactics that are easy are in your slice of the pie. They're what, you know, they're what you've done growing up to get what you want. They're what you've done repeatedly. And what I've been able to through the NMCA, and I didn't used to say slice of the pie, but I used to say this is what you've done a lot of and this is what you haven't and this is where we're going to work. But from my time in the NMCA, what I've discovered is that slice of pie doesn't just apply to how we fight for what we want, which tactics that we are, that we feel uh, comfortable with and uncomfortable with, but also the how we fight for what we want, the qualities in which, um, let's say that the tactic is um, cajoling, right? Making people laugh. Well, there's many different ways. There's there are many different qualities that I can cajole with, and I can cajole with expanded, and I can uh, cajole with different tempos and different rhythms. And so um, for me, one way that I'd like to expand upon my teaching is teaching that notion of our pace of the pie. It's not just about increasing our ability to fight for what we want but increasing our ability to, to color and shadow and add sparkles to or ever how we want to bedazzle uh, how we go about our tactics, that piece of the pie, that how, how we're going to, to do this. I don't use that language and I think it's just because, I, well, I think that's the value of, of these kinds of meetings where you get to revisit the work. I think the Chekhov work is just so rich and full that I get, I focus on what I focus on and then some of the other elements fall by the wayside. And that's why it's just so rich that I, I enjoy this revisiting. I definitely talk to my students in terms of, you know, this is what you're comfortable doing. Or if you are naturally a feeling person, then being playing a thinking character or a willing character might take a little might be harder for you or take a little more effort and so i think that's a similar kind of thing but i love this idea of the pie and i think that that's language that i'll revisit and um, put back into my teaching great great uh anyone else so i'll mention um some of the other things that are part of our pedagogy uh, and that would include the angel walk, which obviously, um, as uh, we all know, is quite a, a powerful experience. Um, and and I, I think that came right out of Will's uh, higher self. Will, do you want to say something about angel walk and spirit? And uh, yeah, I think that was, again, my creative spirit amalgamating other events that I've been part of, things that I experienced and trying to think of how could I bring this to uh, an acting class and what could we do, you know, with that. So, you know, that is, does combine atmosphere. You do cross a threshold. You are certainly working with your higher self during that and how you relate to others. And so to me, it was amalgamating a lot of the tools we use in Chekhov into some sort of beautiful experience. Thank you. So glad you came up with that. <laughs> um, the golden hoop. And there is, uh, uh, I think there's a, an article on the golden hoop that I have on Chekhov.net. Uh, the Golden Hoop is definitely one of the uh, rituals, and the concept of ritual itself is a part of forming and 
uh, creating the environment of, uh, of safety. So the golden hoop is something that I know some teachers are concerned about introducing as being too weird and woo woo and things like that. Um, and most teachers who do venture in say, kind of like Ophir was saying, the first couple of times it was a little awkward for me. Um, uh, and then they often find that if for some reason they forget to do the hoop, the class will demand it. Uh, that, that that process either for opening or closing or just before, uh, you know, backstage, just before you start the show, or whatever that that sense of the feeling of the whole uh, bringing that golden hoop, which is one of the very specific uh, literal opening of the heart exercises that Michael Chekhov actually gives us. So, you know, we make a distinction in NMCA between the ideal artistic center and the heart where Mr. Chekhov is inviting us to open that ideal artistic center. It's a, you could say it's a spiritual organ. It's not the physical heart. And, uh, uh, and it, that there's a distinction because that ideal artistic center is a balance point between the thinking, feeling and willing forces. So it's not overlaid with the um, feeling forces uh, where the, daily feeling forces live, the everyday lower ego feeling forces. It is a higher point and, uh, and, but the golden hoop is specifically where he's really asking us to literally open our hearts, that everyday feeling force merged with that flame of enthusiasm uh, to express appreciation, acknowledge appreciation, and uh, for yourself and for those to radiate it and to receive it. And then moving on, of course, radiating and receiving the entire process of radiating and receiving is all about an allowing of this creative light uh, to, to be expressed. So it's, an, it's a process of activating consciously the process of being able to unite with others to merge and to, uh, to receive and unite by receiving in. So that uniting process again manifests in radiating and receiving. And also we have the circle chart, which uh, not this chart, but this circle, uh, which is present in all, I'm looking for where that is on the next page, 81, um, <clears throat> the circle, which is concentration, imagination, radiation with centeredness, lightness, and ease. So holding those as qualities and uh, activities that are present continuously in our work as artists, uh, as teaching artists, as directors, as performing artists. So that, uh, that entire um, circle of um, tools and qualities are absolutely uh, anchored in this third guiding principle. And finally, the, uh, the concept of how we can approach the psychological gesture. We know the psychological gesture as a whole is founded in that unifying ability of the spirit and, uh, and then the, the NMCA pedagogy of the three eyes, the three pathways into finding it, which is through inspiration where it just appears for you, yay. Um, imagination where you contact that sphere in your higher ego, of your higher ego, of your creative uh, individuality, and you invite the character to reveal uh, whether you travel to its world or it travels to you. Um, that process is um, obviously very connected to spirit. And then the third process, uh, the intellect, 
we are now looking for that higher intellect to be engaged there with the higher ego where we invite ourselves to understand the objective, what does the character want, what are the experience in the loss, what are the experience in the win, creating the compositionary sequence and unifying it into one single uh, psychological gesture with a clear beginning, middle and end. So all of that is possible through this third guiding principle. And ultimately, also one of Mala's favorite exercises, the, if not the favorite exercise, the palaces. Uh, the, in what we do in, in this checkoff training intensive is, of course, the palace of beauty. And we experience it as ourselves, as an artist entering that space. And then we also have the ability to distinguish create the option as an exercise of entering as our character. And that palace can be baptized with many different themes or atmospheres, such as uh, yearnings or nightmares or sorrows uh, or hopes or fantasies, many different things. So that palace um, is absolutely something that you may play with the languaging on how you baptize it. Uh, it is, it, it's like um, crossing into different dimensions, like a matrix. And so maybe if people understand matrix, uh, you can lead them into this matrix. It's a matrix, but where wherever you, whatever dimension you zoom into from this matrix, uh, it's filled with beauty or whatever, whatever you're baptizing it. So one of the, one of the stories uh, that um, my dear friend Janice uh, Orlandi shared was uh, Mala asked Mr. Chekhov, why is it a palace? And he said, oh, oh my dear, because an ordinary house could never contain your imagination. <laughs> so um, it is a palace in as much as it is absolutely grand and goes on and on and on and on and on. So it is to be in an unlimited space. So if some, if you have a group of people who are inclined to start going into, you know, uh, pr fairy tale princess palaces with uh, and limit themselves to the naturalistic environments of an actual palace you could also share these other perspectives will do you want to say something on that well i really like that term of just saying now you're going to enter into an unlimited space and your imagination within this space will have no limits because I've certainly done it with younger groups before that do, they only see a palace and it's gold here and it's this and that. They don't really have the emotional experiences that we'd like them to have. So I think what you're saying is great, so that it's just unlimited space and unlimited with your imagination. Great. Other thoughts, anything, any, any thoughts about anything Lisa, we've shared so far? Where do we find the, the evidence that uh, Chekhov uh, did the golden hoop? Anecdotally, we can say, I mean, I was taught by my Darrington Hall teachers. Uh, so that was directly handed to me and very specifically Deirdre Hurst Dupre. She's a pretty reliable source of <laughs> information. <laughs> She's the person who wrote down every thing Mr. Chekhov said from 1935 to 1942. So most of our publications of Mr. Chekhov would not exist without Deirdre Hurst Dupre, and she was one of my teachers. So she taught me that. And um, and we did it with Beatrice Strait and Eleanor Faison and um, Felicity Mason and Herd Hatfield, who are all members of that Dartington group. And in the um, in, in exercise 13, 
of to the actor, um, we there's quite a, quite a uh, uh, discussion that he has about shifting from exercise 12 into 13 uh, of building contact. And contact is a word that Jack Colvin used quite a bit. And it's everywhere. You, he was really the only teacher of mine, direct student of Chekhov's of mine that really used it a lot. Contact, contact, contact. Um, and because of him, when I started reading, I started seeing how many times Mr. Chekhov uses the term contact, making contact with. And um, in exercise 12, where we're exploring the nature of improvisational an inner improvisational sense with the individuality. Uh, exercise 13 takes it into the ensemble. And before we go into the actual exercises that he's recommending, he takes you through this opening of the heart exercise. And I would say just off out of my head, that would be the closest description to a golden hoop process mm -hmm. uh, that that's written by him yeah, it's lovely. Yeah. that i know of so um i hope that helps yeah sure uh, any so we can start to wrap this up will any thoughts you have about uh just that I appreciate everybody being here and contributing because that's helpful for us and for all of us to unite this way, just like we're saying that creative spirit unites. <laughs> We've been united today and particularly during this challenging time. So I just appreciate all of you for being here. Anyone want to say anything? Is there any topics we're going to address uh, number four and number five, but beyond that, are there topics you'd like to see Will and I discuss? I want a book club. I want to go through his book and have a book club discussion because I want to read the book and I want to talk about it with people, but I find it challenging to focus my attention and energy and the book is challenging and I'd love to unite it with, with you and your understanding of it. That's what I want. Yes, thank you. <laughs> here, here. Yeah. I think that would be fun. <laughs> Fantastic, Janine. What do you think, Will? Sounds good. Yeah. I mean, I think that would make sense. Everybody would be on the same page, so to speak, of reading <laughs> something specific and then being able to give, hey, here's how I worked with it, or here's what happened to me with that, and here's how we've worked with it. That yeah. would work well. Yeah. You know, there's something else I want to mention uh, about this question of the spirit and the higher ego and uh, and how interesting it is that in On the Technique of Acting, which we know was written in 42, the topic, uh, the chapter is number two and it's titled The Higher Ego and uh, it follows imagination and concentration uh, as that's the only thing that precedes it is imagination and concentration understanding and in that he lays out that sort of concept of the sphere um he just you know that the independent existence of images and yet into the actor which is of course the most famous um book and came out almost 50 years before this did the uh that chapter has been moved uh all the way to chapter seven and it's called the creative individuality mm. So uh, already, you, you know, you can see the, um, the pressure that Mr. Chekhov faced in dealing with this um, intangible aspect of his work. And, and you can see where it truly lived in priority in his heart. So I hope you guys will listen once again to these audio lectures on theater and the art of acting and uh and i want to thank you all so much for for coming today I'm thank you will thank, thank you both you. of you thank you very much very nice always very interesting thank you thank you <laughs>
Bye. Bye. See you next time. My favorite person is... One minute on your imaginary bodies. We took a scene from Golden Boy. Uh, we all did the same scene.